Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting. Connecting new money with old money since 2018. And by Change Now, a limitless crypto exchange. Cake Wallet, Sweetwater Digital, and Change Now are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in monerotalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Chris Black, an online public figure known for his efforts to educate the masses about DeFi space and its potential flaws while pushing for more transparency and accountability among projects. The two discuss Chris's journey to becoming a DeFi watchdog, where his passion for privacy comes from, and the general lack of understanding the public has for why privacy is necessary. The two also discuss the importance of Monero and why it will be absolutely crucial in the future, the potential banning of Monero, and how institutional investors' need for privacy may drive interest in Monero in the future. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Chris, thanks for coming on. The pleasure well, is all mine. You are always good. You get you got this whole uh, podcast thing down to a pat. Seems like seems like <laughs> not really. Seem like I, an... I, I have like a short attention span, so I I spin one up, I do a few episodes, and then I get bored. I'm like, I got to change this up. I got to do something different. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, you just keep iterating until you get to the right place. You seem like it happens. Like a you have natural talent for it. Is this something you've been doing pre crypto? My first job out of college was radio DJ. Oh, so okay. um, I worked in radio in college, and then after college, um, as a DJ for a while in upstate New York, and then uh, yeah, I've always been into radio and doing stuff, voiceovers and stuff like that. And uh, so yeah, I did a lot of interviews when I was like working for radio stations and I got comfortable talking to people. So it lends itself to this a little bit. Is that what you studied as well? Did you go to college? Yeah. Well, I started out in engineering school and then I failed miserably out of that and uh, made my way to the television and radio department. <laughs> <laughs> I studied the broadcasting. Stop. The last stop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of engineering were you studying? Uh, well, so I was, uh, accepted into Cornell oh, wow. in upstate yeah. New York and, uh, I lasted about a semester in their engineering program and, uh, it just didn't go my way. It wasn't right for me. Uh, so it never even got as far as like picking a type of engineering, oh, okay. like, all, all the one-on-one courses and like, okay. yeah, just, um, and it just wasn't meshing. And, uh, but then Ithaca College right across town had a great broadcasting program and uh, it worked out great for me because it was, I was so much more into doing that. But it's funny because I took a computer programming course in Pascal. If anybody remembers Pascal, it's like yep. the 90s, early 90s. And uh, oh, I, could, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. And to this day, like I've tried like 10 times maybe to take courses and to learn. I've worked for, for uh Code. I've worked for startups that sell coding boot camps, and I still haven't been able to just completely coalesce around how to sit down and write code. I wish I could so badly, but I just have never been able to figure it out. I fall in that that same camp. I'm an I I went to engineering school, did graduate. I actually did pretty well in engineering school, but yeah, with the computer computer science and like programming, just just was never able to do. It was never able to program, and I always felt like ugh, if I just had that skill set because I always had, you know, I always had the ideas and things I want to try to spin up, but just 
wasn't able to do. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like it's like I can sit down, I can look at code, I can understand code if somebody else wrote it. But to sit down and to conceptualize what you want and then translate that into code is this, I don't know what it is. It's like, it's something, it's a different beast for me. Like I can, I can even sit down with coders and tell them what I want and sort of get, I can project manage even to a certain extent. Right, right. But like once it gets to that point where you have to sit down, put, put pen to paper, you know, like, you know, fingers, a keyboard. Um, I don't know why. And when I was a kid, like I would play around in basic and DOS and stuff like that. And I could figure out how to make a picture on the screen with pixels. You know, but yeah, beyond that, it just never came together for me. <laughs> well, it seems like you're you're kind you kind of have the perfect skill set for being that guy that can bridge between you know uh, the super nerd world uh, of crypto, people that are actually like building the tech, and just the regular Joes that are uh, becoming part of the tech. It seems like you've you've kind of mastered that ability to communicate those things. So uh, yeah. Kudos to yeah. you. You definitely have some certain set of skills that have allowed you to do that quite well, it seems like. Well, I worked in marketing for a long time. And the, the last um, the last like four years of, of before like my, pre my pre-crypto life was head of growth for a few different tech startups. And that really required, because the startups are run by developers. You know, they're developers that they're hiring somebody that they want to be able to market their product and to speak to normal people about it and, you know, put together campaigns. And so it requires that same skill where you can translate between, you know, from a founder of a tech startup who's a super geek developer, you know, and sort of translate their ideas and vision into marketing speak, you know? And so that's where I sort of perfected that a little bit and it's coming in handy now, but it's also really frustrating sometimes because it also, um, like I have so many ideas and so many things that I'd like to see in the space, but I have to rely on other people to execute, you know? So it gets really challenging and it's, it's often hard also to gain the respect of the people who are writing the code. Cause the most common criticism I get is why don't you just shut up and build something? <laughs> and then I come back and say, well, yeah, if I could, I would, um, you know, but yeah, every, I, I still think everybody has a role to play, you know, and everybody has this, every space, whether it's DeFi or, or privacy coins, Monero, you know, Bitcoin, um, everybody has a role to play and they, everybody has a certain type of skill set. And if you don't like it, it doesn't really matter because it's needed. Every, it's an ecosystem. You know, everybody's feeding off of each other. Yeah. That's how yeah. I look at it. No, definitely. Um, we definitely need uh, the Chris Blex of the world. So you, you kind of became the DeFi watchdog, so to speak, right? That's kind of what yeah. you're, how did that happen? How did you become that? How did you go down? Um, well, so I started out, um, I've, I've, I've always been very appreciative of Bitcoin and Monero, you know, as, as the, what I see as the two most decentralized ecosystems in the space and um, the two cryptocurrencies that really have a true use case, um, Monero for privacy and Bitcoin. I look at the use case of Bitcoin really being, aside from being sort of the origin story for everything. Um, the other use case of it is the network effect in the economy that it has, because without that, it would be pretty useless, right? So aside from those two cryptocurrencies, I didn't see a whole lot going on out there. And Ethereum has always been interesting, but um, when I saw DeFi start to bubble up initially, uh, immediately I thought, well, okay, we've got our Bitcoin, we've got our Monero they're decentralized cryptocurrencies, but we don't really have decentralized services to use them with. We have, to, if we want to trade them, if we want to utilize them in any way, we have to go through centralized services. So, is this an opportunity to to guide this in a direction that'll give us what we want? And in those early days, like 2019, we we're starting to figure it out. We were all kind of everybody who wasn't building in the space was naive to what was being built to a certain extent. Like we. And I think a lot of people do this too. They attribute the characteristics of Bitcoin to anything crypto. So like if somebody's really naive about the space, you tell them about Bitcoin. Oh, cool. And then there's this other thing called Cardano. It's also a blockchain. And immediately in their head, they're like, oh, then it must inherit all the same characteristics. And I think a lot of people operate in that way until they know better. 
And so a lot of us were thinking when we saw the smart contracts that were being built, the services they were offering, we didn't stop to think, is there actually one private key that could drain all the money or make radical changes to the code? And it took us, you know, a good, almost a year to figure that out. And after that, for me, it pivoted quickly because I was doing onboarding educational videos and stuff like that. And as soon as I learned about the centralization of power and the ability of developers to to drain funds if they chose to, it just conflicted so much with everything I appreciated about Bitcoin that I just wanted to educate people about that. You know, so that that's what I've been doing for like <laughs> the better part of probably a year and a half now. It's just focusing on that because because not enough people are aware and the people are putting their life savings into these things without yeah. really understanding how they don't, there's no evidence that the developer of that protocol doesn't have their private key written down on a beer coaster sitting on their coffee table. Like you don't know. And as, as stupid as it sounds, you can't prove that's not true because of the nature of private keys and seed phrases and stuff like that. So um, that's what I've been really trying to focus on since then. Yeah, and I, I guess you've been doing it at the perfect time, right? Because I think it's as DeFi was really going mainstream, so to speak, in the crypto world. Mm-hmm. And so do you talk about Monero? I only recently learned about you. So uh, I think you had tweeted something about Monero, and then uh, people in the Monero community were commenting on you and retweeting it. And then I checked you out, and I saw you had tons of followers. I was like, oh, who is this guy? Like, he's uh, <laughs> got a big following, and he likes Monero. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> started watching some of your stuff is like oh but he's, he's a DeFi guy so do you talk about Monero as well I know you mentioned it's you know it's one of your preferred projects Bitcoin Monero you see those as being true cryptos yeah is this something I've always said um I think that Bitcoin Monero and Ethereum are the three most clearest use cases and I don't look at I mean it's okay so you've got thousands of cryptocurrencies everyone pro- claims to have some purpose um but you know, as far as base layer cryptocurrencies native to a chain, it's hard for me to see beyond those three as far as having clear use cases. And yeah, you could make case, like I said, for hundreds of them. But from my point of view, um, you know, those are the three that that make the most sense. And so uh, I've always been open. Like before I got into DeFi, I was I was pretty vocal about Bitcoin and um, and also about privacy in general. And, you know, I think the thing about Monero is I am passionate about privacy. You know, I'm passionate about, I'm passionate about liberty. I'm passionate about privacy. I'm passionate about self-sovereignty. So those are the reasons that I even look at these things. You know, I don't look at this stuff just as an investment or anything like that. I'm looking at it as a means to an end. So you're from the Mon- over here, I, I totally agree with you. That, that yeah. surprised me as well. Go ahead. Yeah. So like, you know, it's, it gets tricky because Bitcoin clearly now serves as a store of value. It's debatable, of course, but people use it in that way. Ethereum serves as the, you know, computing layer, you know, for smart contracts and whatever people want to do with that. And Monero to me serves as the, um, it's, it's, you can equate it to just privacy, you know, it's straight up privacy and I value privacy. I do my best tech technologically to maintain privacy and OPSEC and stuff like that. And, um, but I don't look at Monero as like an investment or a buy and hold forever type thing. I look at it as it's there when you need it, you know, and it's important that we foster the community and, and make sure that it's there when we need it, <laughs> you know, because right now maybe we don't need it. But in one year, five years, 10 years, we're definitely going to need it, you know, and, uh, and if not Americans, then other countries are going to need it, you know, so that's the way that I approach it. So I've always mentioned it and talked about it. It's just for the past year or two, most of the attention I've been getting has been around the DeFi stuff, you know, and it, but it's applying those same principles to DeFi. And that's what frustrates a lot of DeFi developers is that I take Bitcoin and Monero principles. Right. and apply them to Ethereum-based work, which right. to them isn't fair. But to me, it's the only way. <laughs> it's the only way. Nothing else makes sense to me. So do you see eventually uh, DeFi, you know, the ideal version of DeFi being built on a truly decentralized base layer like 
Bitcoin or Monero? Even though we get to that well, point. so here's what we're seeing right now. So DeFi started to bubble up, obviously, like two, two and a half years ago. And ever since then, it's been um, it's been these Silicon Valley backed startups that have had the most success. So Uniswap, Compound, MakerDAO, you know, all of these startups have had the most success because they they get the funding, um, they can hire people, they can create a company, they can uh, they can market their product, and so now we're in a situation where we've got these startups that are having great success and they've got the backing and the whole time because they had Silicon Valley ties, they knew very well that they were going to face regulatory challenges, you know? So right now it's big news, right? It's like, it's all over the place, like stable coins and DeFi and um, Elizabeth Warren is lashing out and everybody's, you know, SEC and CFTC. So uh, they knew this was coming and there's no way for, this type of DeFi to exist without the regulatory embrace. It just can't because you've got companies that are known entities in the United States of America that are building it. So then you, then Jack Dorsey comes along now and, and is talking about building um, like some sort of new DeFi on Bitcoin and stuff like that. There's RSK out there as well. That's building DeFi on Bitcoin. But, um, they're all going to run into the same challenges until they understand that this cannot work um, in a self-sovereign way without some level of anonymity behind it. You know, so as long as you know who the organizations or the the founders or the companies or whoever's building it, there's going to be somebody to go after. And with every with most of the stuff that's being really successful on DeFi on, on Ethereum, they knew that from the start. So there was never an intention to really be fully uh, decentralized in the way that you and I picture decentralization. It was always an intention to have an oligarchy where the investors, the founders, they hold most of the tokens. They can make radical changes if they need to in order to comply with regulators. Um, so we're going to reach a point where we need to start to distinguish between DeFi, what they're calling DeFi, which is basically what I see is big banking 2.0. I don't see any reason that in three, five years, we don't see a Chase bank chain, uh, a TD bank chain, you know, like all these different layer twos or threes or fives, whatever built on top of Ethereum. That's, that's where it's going. And I don't like it. I don't want to use it. You know, I would love to see a truly decentralized finance built uh, in another place, but it's all going to happen on layer twos. That's the problem. You know, once you get to a layer two or three, you start to get into situations where you have to centralize, you know? And uh, so that's where the challenges lie. You know, I think it's in maintaining the same level of trustlessness that you have on the base layer. As soon as you move to a layer two, it, it dissipates, you know, we still haven't figured out the best way to um, tackle that as a, as a technological community yet. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a, it's a big engineering task, but I do think we're moving in that direction. Do, I mean, do you think eventually we'll see DeFi essentially natively on running on top of Monero as a, as a second layer or third layer? Well, it's, it's, see, it's two different things. Like, cause it, if it's on a second or third layer, it's not native anymore. It, well, ru running the, on top of Monero though, at least, at least that, at least it's on a strong decentralized censorship resistant foundation, right? I mean, I look at it that way too, as opposed to Ethereum, tricky. which arguably, you know, uh, isn't as immutable as as we've seen, you know, in 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 the past. Uh, Bitcoin, which you know, uh, seemingly very decentralized, but you know, we know things like the mining network is somewhat centralized, giving ASICs, or there's, you know, it's it's not fungible, obviously. So this mm -hmm. idea of would it would it at least be closer towards the ideal if we built it on top of something like Monero or you're, you don't even really see that um, adding much value? I, I don't really take issue with the, and obviously it's debatable. From my point of view as a Bitcoin aficionado and understanding the consensus mechanisms and stuff, I don't really take umbrage with Ethereum's uh, proof of work mechanism. Proof of stake is a different story. 
Um, but up till now, I don't think it's it's been any part of the problem. The real problem is, and here, a good example is RSK, our, our rootstock. Mm -hmm. So rootstock is a layer is um, a layer two. Uh, I don't know if they call it layer two or side chain. I forget. But anyway, it it sits alongside Bitcoin, and you can run smart contracts on on uh, RSK. And uh, Sovereign is somebody who I just did a podcast with, and it's kind of like a, a compound and a Uniswap and like a lending and borrowing and swapping tool all in one built on RSK. And the whole idea is that it's more, it's supposed to be more decentralized than what's going on on Ethereum because it's uh, validated by Bitcoin network. The problem is in order to get your Bitcoin onto RSK, you have to lock your Bitcoin in an address on the Bitcoin network. You can't actually move Bitcoin off of Bitcoin chain, right? It has to, you, that's not the way cryptocurrencies work. So that bridge is actually you locking it. And then it's tokenized on the RSK network for you to use over there. And then once you have it there, the smart contract like Sovereign, for instance, if you want to lend it on their uh, protocol, you have to do your own research as far as are there private keys protecting that specific protocol on that network. And then it becomes irrelevant what your base layer is because you're just looking at what private keys did they hold, did they maintain on this specific smart contract on this network. So if we did ever get to a point where there was a layer two, uh, you know, sort of Ethereum compatible um, layer two that allowed smart contracts that would hook back into Monero, you'd have the same issues where every single smart contract can be written in any which way, you know, and uh, anybody could have the keys, they could have hidden bugs in there that they could exploit later on their own. You know, they could have, uh, there's, there's all the same, the same problems that we see on Ethereum could be replicated on a Monero layer two. It's regardless of the base layer, you know, it's all about that, that um, Turing uh, complete, uh, Ethereum compatible mechanism, you know, what it allows you to do. What's your, what's your take on atomic swaps? Have you been watching that development? So now we now have atomic swaps happening between Bitcoin and Monero. Uh, what, what do you think about atomic swaps? I mean, does that, does that check the boxes for you in terms of being decentralized? Yeah, I think it's fascinating. Yeah. I think that, um, from what I've seen so far, it's, it's going to, that could really change everything. You know, it could change the whole game. Um, the one thing I don't know yet, and I haven't looked at it enough yet to try to understand is whether it could be attacked, you know, and how easy it would be to attack it and to cause people, if not to make it unusable, but to make people lose faith in it. You know, um, that's the one thing that I'm not clear on yet, but the idea that you can move seamlessly and, and trustlessly between Bitcoin and Monero, for instance, um, opens up a whole new world of privacy options for people. Obviously, when I talk about an attack, I'm talking about state actors because it's straight up, uh, straight up going to piss people off you know, on the regulatory front. <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, you know it's one of those things that can be when we get into these worlds of options that can be used by anyone in the world for any purpose any reason to us, we hear Liberty to them. They hear crime, you know, and, uh, there's just two different, it's like that cognitive dissonance that as long as we're living in the security state of mind in the world, we're going to keep running into these options. So as long as there's no choke points with it, which there doesn't seem to be, it's a great thing. But yeah, the question is still that economy, which it, it is an economy. Like, is it attackable? What's the attack surface? Like, maybe, you know, better than me. Um, but I, it's still in the early days and I don't think it's caught anybody's radar yet. Yeah. I'm not technical enough to say whether or not it's, it's completely resistant to, to certain tax. Um, but my understanding is it, it's uh long-term once things are worked out, it's, it's pretty, pretty unstoppable. Um, you, you bring up some good points though, with the fact that, yeah, when, when we see things like this happen, we hear Liberty and, you know, regulators hear, you know, financing of, of terrorism or, you know, uh, use on the dark markets. Uh, yeah. How do we, you know, or 
How do you see that playing out? I mean, so we hear Liberty. Do you think others mainstream will start to hear Liberty as well when they when they uh, become aware of this tech? Do we get to that point? I see no. you shaking your head now, but uh, no. but like you know. We, we have a lot of incidents happening now, right? It's not um, as far-fetched. It's not just something we're reading about in some sci-fi book, but it's like happening in real time, right? We're seeing presidents get deplatformed from, uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook. We're seeing all types of censorship happening. Um, you don't think that's starting to hit home with the regular, you know, regular Joe, Joe American, who's saying, wait a minute. It's interesting to think about like the different angles on this. You know, if you, for instance, all right, so right now I'm in uh, Florida and I don't give my exact location, but uh, I'll tell you that I'm in a place in Florida where it it's not uncommon to drive down the street and see F Joe Biden signs and Trump 2024 signs. <laughs> so it's like yeah. <laughs> a lot of pickup trucks and quiet spot. I like it, but, um, but you know, these, uh, sentiments to me, they don't equate to Liberty, you know, they equate to, um, anger, you know, and these, the, the thing is when you go to the airport, you're still taking off your shoes. You know, it's like you're, people are complying with all the, the current laws and rules, uh, when it comes to finance, when it comes to banking, when it comes to KYC, AML, there's no resistance. And it's because 9-11 changed everything, right? It was like after that, everybody just wanted to be safe. So the narrative is always going to be the narrative. Um, in my opinion, we're, these, these type of technologies are, are never going to be seen as the panacea that we kind of see them as because we're looking at it from a very minority point of view at this point. And the same goes for DeFi too. You know, any truly trustless DeFi applications, uh, you know, where they could be used by anybody in the world without censorship, you know, without geopolitical considerations. Uh, again, we see it as great. Other people see it as terrorism or <laughs> drug dealing or whatever. And so uh, I don't think that's ever going to stop because people are too far gone. You can just see with what's been going on with the vaccine mandate uh, debates and stuff like that, um, a full in the United States, a full 100, 250 million people are completely compliant, right? So it's like without question. But we, you know? do, so, we do have those that are pushing back, right? We do. They're, they're, sure. not, they're not being completely silent, right? We're seeing people on... Uh, on Twitter that, you know, 10 years ago, well, cause you didn't have this incident, but you just wouldn't see people speaking out to that degree against the well, right. mainstream narrative. Yeah. And thank God for that. You know, um, I guess my point is though, that as we all know, government takes two steps forward as far as the power it takes. And then because of pushback back, it might take one step back, never two steps back and definitely never three steps back. Right. So it's a continued march towards authoritarianism. And I don't think that that's going to change. So in my opinion, the only way that things like Monero, um, trustless DeFi, um, and other things that are still sort of not regulated, um, the only way they can really succeed is to remain untouchable, remain untouchable by the feds, <laughs> you know, remain untouchable by the regulators. You know, when a, a, a month or two ago, I actually had a chance to sit down and interview or have a chat with uh, one of the SEC commissioners, Solid. Hester Peirce. And one of the questions I asked her was, because she mentioned that if DeFi developers have questions about the legality of what they're doing, they should come to the SEC and ask them, like, is this, yeah. is this okay? And so I said to her, okay, so if let's say it's 2009 and Satoshi Nakamoto calls you up and says, I'm working on this thing called Bitcoin. And I, I'm not sure if it's compliant. I have some questions for you. How would that have gone? And she she flat out said, like, he'd probably still be waiting for an answer. For, yeah, <laughs> he'd probably that. still have, like, a don't take any action uh, motion or something. Like He'd still be sitting there collecting dust and waiting for permission. Yeah, that was a, um, you really summed it up with that question when you asked her that, which would be the kind of the issue that, that resides there with, with regulators and, 
this tech that's basically just supposed to uh, was built to exist, uh, whether or not regulations were trying to stop it. Like it's it's not it's not meant to even deal with regulations, right? It's pretty much meant to exist in such a way that it's untouchable by regulations. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The the problem with Bitcoin, though, as we know, obviously, which Monero tries to tackle, is that it's transparent enough where it can be used. Uh, in a way that satisfies regulators as far as surveillance and, and stuff like that. So when Monero removes that, it closes a lot of doors, right? It close, you know, obviously with Bitcoin, it's very hard in the United States and most Western countries to buy it without providing your full identification and basically get a permission slip from the federal government. You know, you have to do KYC AML in order to, you know, unless you're going to a peer-to-peer network, which 99.9% of people won't do, you know, 0.1% will, you know, but, but again, like I'm thinking about the world. I'm not just, just thinking about our early days community here. I'm thinking about the people that really will need Monero, you know, when their country collapses, their currency collapses, um, their, you know, a dictator rises to power. You think about the Venezuelas and the, you know, the different places in the world where, they need anonymity today, and uh, those those places, you know, can make it very very difficult. You know, so uh, Bitcoin has that weakness that Monero solves, but the fact that Monero solves it is is what makes it public enemy number one. So as we already know, it's so hard to already it's getting harder to to purchase over the counter or to purchase for off an exchange. Yeah, you know? yeah, so. Yeah. But yeah, you, it's... So you're 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 a marketing guy, though. You understand these things pretty well in terms of how ideas spread and how to spread ideas. Uh, but like the you know the Streisand effect, right? So here here Monero is enemy number one, right, in the crypto community. Uh, we saw I don't know if you saw John Oliver did a piece on ransomware and highlighted Monero and compared it to body shaped uh, plastic tubs that obviously have only one use case. Mm-hmm. Uh, but all that, all those, all that attention, isn't it potentially positive for Monero? Kind of feeding into the game theory behind crypto in general that got Bitcoin going in the first place. So yeah, sure, uh, it's enemy number one. But maybe people start to look at it and wonder why it's enemy number one. You know why? Why Coinbase hasn't listed Monero yet? Why the U.S. Treasury has a bounty out for trying to trace Monero? Um, yes, you'll have those who are just like, well, it must be bad. Let's, you know, let's try to crush it. But you might have a lot of other Americans and people around the world saying, wait a minute, does that mean it's, it's doing something different than the other ones? Well, all right, but look at it from this context. Um, and I don't know the exact stats on this, but I know not too long ago, majority of Americans thought Edward Snowden was a traitor. <laughs> okay, so you know, Edward Snowden was the obviously the first or one of the first people to make it clear to us that we were being spied on, the level of surveillance going on in big tech, partnerships with the government, clearly stuff that most people you would think would be against. But you get to today, and even you know, you got Donald Trump when he was president wanted to have the guy executed, you know? So you start to think, well, geez, how could that be happening? You know, what is that narrative that is, that is villainizing privacy to that extent, you know, and that narrative is being pounded over and over and over where if you don't have anything to hide, you shouldn't be trying to hide it. And that's been being pounded for 50 plus years, you know, in this country and around the world. And it's not going to stop because very powerful people want that notion to be accepted. You know, they don't want people to be private, period. You know, and they say it's for combating crime and terrorism and stuff, but, you know, it's really for control. It's for control of a society. So Monero is always going to be anti-society. It's always going to be meant for the people who know better. You know, for the people who see what's it's for the red pilled people who actually get it, you know, so it's always going to be counterculture. And uh, 
I do think it'll gain awareness, clearly. I mean, but what you just said, like, people are going to keep hearing about it. And already it's being used in a lot of different ways, right? It's just for it to be, um, for it to gain acceptance in any way or to be recognized in a positive light by a government, I don't think that's possible. I don't think that'll ever happen. You know, it's just they'll always want to shut it off because they're all in the interest of controlling their population. So I just don't ever see how that, but but to me, that's what makes Monero useful. <laughs> I don't want a Monero that's okay with the government. I don't want a Monero that that the regulators think is is good. You know, I don't want them to sit there and say, we can live with Monero. I want them to see it as a threat. See, I, I kind of disagree there. I obviously, you know, I strong believer in all the all the cypherpunk ideals. And, you know, I think it's all about building tech that can't be stopped 100 percent That being said, I'd like to see United States or some other country somewhere step up and be like, you know what? We love we love what this protocol is doing, what it stands for. Uh, it's free speech money, and we want it to thrive here because we think it aligns with the values of 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 who we are and what we want society to be. And it will help open societies persevere in the coming digital age. I mean, I ran for Congress here in in New York, and these are ideas I tried getting across. But you you wouldn't want. I I, I think it's far fetched for that. I guess happen here in the United States, but you wouldn't want to see it happen if tomorrow that you know senators and Congress people started waking up to that and started making that part of their their narrative. No, I would I would welcome it if if that happened if they woke up and started to to say yay let's do Monero, but it it's just the nature of the way that our government has changed over the last hundred years prohibits it. You know, it's like it's it's got the, the American government has never sort of moved back, even under Reagan in situations like that. Like it never really shrunk itself and gave away power that it already had, you know, and now we're getting into a time where every transaction over six hundred dollars, they want full surveillance and full reports to the government and stuff like that. And w clearly we're way far down the road to complete and open uh surveillance, willing surveillance, you know, by the government of everything that we do financially. So to, to sort of believe that we could wake up in a year or two or five and the, and the U S would suddenly be okay with complete privacy. Uh, it runs counter to everything that's going on right now with the elimination of cash with this, you know, the new stuff Biden wants to do. Uh, and, but this also affects Western countries around the world that already have far less privacy than we do in Europe and other places. Um, so I think it's a bit of a pipe dream, to be honest with you. Um, so when I say I don't want to see the government accepting a Monero, I'm talking about our government as it actually exists. Because if our government as it exists does not see Monero as a threat, that means Monero is not as useful as I thought. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's indicative of the fact that Monero is probably broken or not working as, as it does. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 I agree with you there, but you know, I, I don't know. I'm definitely an idealist. I, it is a pipe dream, but I, I think America itself was kind of a pipe dream when you, you look at the ideas that it, it was started upon. And, um, I don't know, uh, you know, governments are run by people, right? Uh, it, it does, we've seen the tide already change so drastically with crypto in general. I mean, right. I mean, from a few years back, the, the narratives that we're hearing coming out of representatives today versus what we were hearing, you know, five years ago. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily predicted that, you know, we, uh, I think mm -hmm. it's pretty drastic, you know, now people are, I'm seeing, you know, representatives tweet out, say, Hey, you know, Hey, crypto community, what, what do you want to, what do you want us to do in Congress to help support Bitcoin is essentially what yeah. they're saying, which is pretty, pretty dramatic. Um, so I don't know. I think Monero isn't too far away from that, considering that's what crypto was meant to be. So I don't know. I guess I well, guess I'm a dreamer. There. Uh, so I mean, the only reason Bitcoin is is being talked about the way it is right now, I think, is because it's it's too far gone for them to be able to control. Mm -hmm. It's a global economy. By the time Congress got around to looking at it, it was already too big for them to get their arms around. 
if it was not at that level, they definitely would have done whatever they could have to change it, to villainize it. To, and they spent, you know, many years villainizing it. Um, so I think that that's why Bitcoin is now being looked at in that favorable light. I'll tell you this too, uh, DeFi on Ethereum is just now starting to be looked at by regulators seriously. And there's big money waiting on the sidelines from institutions like banks and, and institutional investors and hedge funds and ETF funds and uh, ETF managers. And uh, they're all waiting to get into it. They haven't touched it yet because there hasn't been clear regulatory guidance on what's okay and what's not. They're all waiting for the regulators to sign off and say, go. Okay. And so that's the same thing that happened with Bitcoin. They had to study Bitcoin and understand not only is it decentralized and trustless around the world, it's also regulatable to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. We can apply um, KYC and identity requirements on the purchases by individual um, users. We can surveil them way better than we can through cash or other means. You know, So they are okay with it now because they figured that out. With Monero and other privacy tech, they... Again, like as long as they can't figure that out, as long as they can't surveil Monero users, they're gonna hate this, okay? Because you can't get big money into it. You know, big institutions, banks, etc. They're not gonna be dumping money into Monero unless they're what? really up to something bad. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm what? talking. Well, no, but I, he, I'll, bank. I'll let you finish your point, then I'm gonna. Well, because yeah. they're regulated, they don't want to go to jail. They have the they when they created their bank, they promised to provide a certain level of transparency to the government. So if they start putting money into into complete anonymity, it just doesn't serve their purposes, you yeah. know. So and then the, but then it's a big cycle. So if you don't get the big money interested, if you don't get the hedge funds and the ETFs interested, you're not going to get favorable treatment from politicians and regulators because one hand washes the other, you know. So all of a sudden you've got this tech that is frowned upon by by the big money by and big money i'm talking about regulated big money so i'm talking about not individuals but hedge funds and you know the ones that have to provide transparency reports to the sec and stuff like that um they're never going to touch monero uh, because it just doesn't fit into what they're trying to do monero is not an a suitable financial investment for a regulated entity that wants to stay on the good side of the government. It's just, to me, it's not. And I'm seeing it already with DeFi where they're waiting to jump in until they get that green light. They're just all, there's billions of dollars waiting to jump into DeFi. So, uh, I think but Monero, Monero to me, it just, it's, it's the, it's, it's the, um, it serves a very specific purpose for individuals and for individual freedom and for the ability to have free movement around the world. I think these are things that every human should have access to, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, it runs counter to societal acceptance on a grand scale. In my opinion, I don't think you can have both of those things. Mm. Even though, even though ultimately we want, we want to live in a, a free and open society, right? So how, how is it running counter to it's running counter because there is no free and open society on planet earth right now. Right. Every society is being run by corrupt authoritarians, sure. you know? And so, okay, sure. If we somehow find a place on earth to set up Liberty land, you know, and we can have Monero as the national currency, I'm all for it. Monerotopia. It already exists. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll move there. I would gladly move there, but we're living in the real world, you yeah. know, and the real world is going in a direction that is total surveillance and total authority for the, for the, a very few people at the top of the government and Monero runs counter to that. So that's why I'll say it over and over. Like, I think Monero is the anti uh, real world, <laughs> you know, it's, and so it's going to be for people who truly understand that. And that's not a lot of people, but these are the people that I do think will rebuild society when it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so on on a philosophical level, you, this is the direction you want things to go in, correct? Like you you'd want oh, yeah. society to go in that direction. Oh, I would. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think the the people that 
conceptualize the United States of America would fully support its destruction today. I do. The founding fathers. I, I just, you know, it's gone so far from the original vision um, that, so, so I think that, you know, and, I, and I'm on board with their vision. Okay. So I think the constitution is one of the greatest political documents just ever written. It's so perfect in the way that it was set up and the Republic and stuff. And so, you know, for us to be so far from it now, you know, is, uh, I, I think that, that the, the idea of privacy and, uh, sort of self-sovereignty to the founders of this country were, were just as important as freedom of speech and, you know, freedom to bear arms and stuff like that. It's just, they couldn't foresee what was coming, you know, obviously, and we can't foresee what's going to come in another 200 years. We have no idea, you know, like we don't know where things are heading. Um, people are going to look back at what we're doing now in the same way we look back at the founding fathers, you know, and then thinking that far, that long ago, it's like, you can't relate back that far. So um, what's it going to look like? We don't know, but I would love for things to proceed in a way that people actually respect Liberty uh, it's just with the growing population on the planet, with the scarce resources, with it's just becoming more and more clear that that's going to be really hard to do unless we can figure out interplanetary travel, in which case maybe we'd get a little more land available to us. Mm -hmm. We won't go there <laughs> on this episode. Uh, push. Uh, you, you mentioned at the outset, like you you wouldn't really recommend Monero as an investment per se, and you know you're bringing up your points uh, that it's kind of contrary to mainstream society, especially here in America and the banking industry and regulation. But there, there's, well, there's a few points there. One, you know, um, I think I think it does uh, have these uh, properties of digital gold, perhaps even more so than Bitcoin, uh, because it's fungible and private and privacy equals security, right? So we, we're starting to, once again, we're we're realizing what powers governments might have and seeing them actually start to use some of these things in ways only uh, imagined in our worst dreams. Uh, so this idea of maybe the government trying to take away people's crypto uh, isn't so far-fetched and you might want to hold something like Monero, uh, which is untraceable, uh, you know, because boating accidents do happen. And so when they come to get your Monero, maybe you don't have your private keys anymore. So there's security reasons as to why you might want to hold Monero. So I'd like, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. And two, just uh, your your thoughts on looking at it in, in a slightly different way in terms of Monero being contrary to, to regulation and the banking industry is that maybe something like Monero is actually easier for... Um, the banking industry and exchanges to use uh, to basically comply with current regulations as they currently exist, especially with things like cash, uh, because it's not traceable. It doesn't have a history attached to it. So there uh, is no expectation to track and trace because you, you can't. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that as well. So like this, you know, Kraken, Monero is on Kraken. We use, it's, it's a major exchange. Why can't, you know, Coinbase and all these other exchanges add Monero? And then maybe, you know, maybe they don't have to, they don't have to do the, the chain analysis and they don't have to do the things that are expected of them with other cryptos simply because they can't do it. And maybe there's an incentive for them to want to use Monero because of that, because now there's uh, less hoops they have to jump through and less money they have to put out for these <clears throat> following these regulations. Yeah. Too big. I, I guess the... Well, that that the second question sort of assumes that that big exchanges or corporations in the space actually value liberty or value privacy, and there's absolutely I've seen zero reason to believe that Coinbase as a company values liberty or privacy over profit or over compliance. You know, I think that, um, I mean, Coinbase is providing analytics services to the federal government, public knowledge. They're developing surveillance tools for the government to use to analyze blockchain transactions and to, to find people that are doing things that the government doesn't like or, you know, maybe evading taxes. I'm not totally sure what the whole thing is, but they're doing the exact opposite 
of adopting Monero and supporting Monero. Now, um, Jesse Powell, Kraken, he's clearly, you know, he's running the company and he, he values liberty and privacy from what I know about him. So, um, you know, it's, it's a smaller business than Coinbase. It's, um, you know, it's on the radar, obviously, but I, I mean, I just don't think the trend is moving in that direction. Yeah, I, th I don't think, I think the Coinbase thing, and I just want to, just so we don't lose track, is uh, might be more of the fact that they're, you know, Zcash bag holders and things like that. I don't know if it's really about the regulation side. You think it's that Coinbase isn't adding Monero because of regulatory pressure? Yeah, I mean, they don't support private Zcash transactions, right? They just support um, open or public ones. So I, I do think that it's about staying compliant. And I think they, what I'm saying is I'm giving the example of their analytics work because not only are they compliant, but they go above, they've been going above and beyond to provide services to, you know, to a government that completely seeks to eliminate privacy, you know? So I, I, I see no reason for them to turn around and suddenly say, we're going to go against the trend. We're going to, um, we're going to support this cryptocurrency that, that is untraceable and offers complete privacy. Um, that the government is sure to hate. <laughs> you know, this also might not be a terrible thing for Monero because I think that if Coinbase did adopt Monero and offer it, it would be much more on the radar uh, for the government. You know, if a lot of people suddenly started buying Monero and using it um, because Coinbase offered it, I think that it would be a lot faster to, to crack down and to make sure Kraken and nobody else was able to offer it. I don't think it's a terrible thing. And this is why I say Monero as an investment is, and when I say an investment, I mean a buy and hold store of value investment. Um, I, I look at the Monero price as a reflection and the fact that Monero is like number 40 or whatever by TVL or whatever, you know, or by a market cap rather. Yeah, I don't even um, <laughs> Like it's, it's a, the price of privacy. That's the way I look at it. It's this is how our society values privacy. Our you look at the top ten market cap coins. There's nothing there about privacy. You know, it's all about like Binance and you know, obviously Bitcoin and Ethereum, but the Cardano and and you know what else is up there? Solana. Like, there's no privacy. People don't care about privacy. They just want to make money. They care about profit. Uh, the the value of privacy in the in the Bitcoin in the crypto world is number forty, <laughs> so it's like uh, I don't see the world waking up and changing. At least the ones that that are currently just focusing on profit and you know and growing their capital and stuff like that. So I wouldn't be surprised. By the way, I know this is a Monero show, and I know I I'm somewhat negative on certain aspects. That's what I'm here for. I'm the anchor. I'm, a, my, I'm holding the moral, I'm the all moral of, Okay, yeah. The moral of my story is I think Monero is one of the most valuable, most undervalued uh, assets on the planet. I really do. And I do foresee a day where it is like in the top three by market cap. I do. But I think that's going to happen when things go seriously wrong <laughs> in a large part of the world. And people finally realize, which they don't now, when they finally realize that having all of your money under total surveillance is going to severely impact their lives, their families, their families' lives, their heirs' lives. You know, eventually governments are going to step in with inheritances, you know, and with passing things down to your kids, you know, and your grandkids, and it's inevitable. They're already doing it with estate taxes. But I mean, beyond that, they, Elizabeth Warren talks about all the time that she thinks that it should be basically just a small percentage of your wealth you're able to pass down. So it's like, once governments go that far, and they say all the work you did all your life is meaningless, because 90% of what you have when you die is going to go to the government, and we're going to redistribute it. And you maybe we'll give your kids 10%. I think stuff like that is going to start to wake people up and they're going to realize, you know what? This is not legit. This is not moral. And this is not okay. And I need another way to, to get around this because they've got all the guns and they can enforce their rules, but they can't enforce them after I'm dead. 
And so, you know, it's like we need other tools. We can't just abide by immoral laws. And it's okay to to say no to immoral laws. You know, I think that's where Monero is going to become very, very valuable. But it's going to take time and it's going to happen over a longer period of time because that doesn't all happen in a day. You know, that's going to be, you know, if you're talking about that kind of use case, that takes decades, you know, to to slowly build, you know, and and eventually um, it'll reach a value where it should be. But uh, it's going to be a slow build and unless something dramatic happens like, you know, tomorrow, um, which it would, you never know how things so would play out. But. We live in right now, right? Like we, so we're seeing that, that rate there, they are going to try to do that, right? So anything over $600 gets reported directly to the IRS. Is that, what's the, the rule they're looking at? Looking yeah, at? that's it. Yeah. yeah. It's, so, it's, I mean, even something that's similar, right? So if you're, that might push people into, into cash, right? Which doesn't really exist anymore. It's becoming hard to use or right. it could push people into Monero. It could push people into Bitcoin thinking that it solves the problem, but then maybe they would soon realize it doesn't solve that problem, that they're just as censored right. or just as tracked and surveilled there. So I don't know. These, these wake-up calls may happen sooner than later, I think. I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the problem is though you need you need somebody who's willing to accept it too. Mm. And uh, if you go to the store, you go to the coffee shop or restaurant, they're not going to accept it because it's illegal to accept, right? Because you have to, uh, actually, that, that I might be misspeaking there. You know, yeah. I think, but I think we could be entering a world where- not illegal to, I was, I, is this your scenario? You mean if they, they try to ban Monero? Well, if they, well, I, I guess it, what I'm saying is it's illegal to accept it and not, eventually report it right so it's like it always has to make its way back to the books well it's like cash right so you know uh, there's there's plenty of restaurants here in new york city that are cash only you know but it's it's yeah 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 only but you still have to pay your taxes right you still have to report your your income uh so you know monero's perfectly legal you can people can even here in new york as draconian as it is you can still uh you know accept monero for whatever service or product you're selling um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do think um, between now and the eventual realization of the true value of Monero, I have very little doubt that it's going to encounter massive amounts of government problems. <laughs> you know, I think that they'll try to ban it effectively. Yeah, in yeah, the United States? yeah. Really? I do. I do. Wow. I see it as inevitable. So, so will uh, you will you support me when I'm out there, like a like a madman in Washington D.C. camping out in front of a uh... The capital, of course. With my Monero flags. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's just a matter of time until. I mean, we already had the the a big scare in recent months was with the pipeline shut down, and then the rumor was initially that it was a Monero uh, transaction. It turned out to be Bitcoin, I think. Right? Mm-hmm. I'm not even sure if the I, I'm forgetting the whole. Yeah, story. well, no, that they they caught the guys or some of right. One asset of them, they were they're basically able to track and trace Bitcoin, and that helped. Them. Right, they used Bitcoin initially. The, all the reports said Monero, and I said, "Oh, this is it. This mm-hmm. is the one they were waiting for." But I, I do think that uh, there's going to be a situation where it is uh, used illicitly, mm-hmm. the oh, same yeah. way cash, the same way cash could be, and the same way cash was used in 9/11. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that um, it's just going to take one of those instances for people to be. And God forbid it's a 9-11 type thing, mm-hmm. you know, but I mean, if, if something happens uh, where Monero is involved, it's all the excuse they need to, to crack down and it will not have public support. Mm-hmm. It won't. Because if you remember after 9-11, everybody just wanted to do whatever the government said. <laughs> it's like when you're in that mode, yeah, you know, it's know. whatever, anything. You want our privacy? Take it. You can have all of it. Patriot Act, go. Like, we're fine. No, and then seeing, five years later, we're like, that was COVID, missing. right? We're seeing it. We're living it right yeah. now. COVID. People are just except to give up all their all their all their rights, all their liberty for this. Yeah. Thing. Except now we know a little bit better. A lot of us. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew enough to move to Florida, so uh, <laughs> you know it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see. But I, I do think that between now and Monero's true realization, um, it's going to go through even harder times because of the way every government on earth is moving. It's just, they don't reverse course ever until there's a revolution, until they're torn down. 
and um, barring that happening, it's just going to keep moving in this authoritarian way. Mm -hmm. Well, you speak about it very eloquently, you know, and you talk about it a lot in terms of DeFi is what you're normally talking about, but you're always talking about these ideas of liberty and decentralization, and that's what this is all about. Um, do you think we start to see others talk about it this way? So even like the BTC maxis or um, those that are getting mainstream attention, do they start to talk about Monero or they're just going to ignore that it's getting that it's getting its ass kicked in the corner by governments that, that are trying to ban it? Are they just going to kind of is everybody going to look the other way or will that drum up support for Monero from the general cryptocurrency community that supposedly believes in these ideals? <clears throat> I think most Bitcoin maximalists are not really prioritizing liberty you know i think that maybe they're prioritizing their financial freedom their personal financial freedom but it's at the expense of other people's liberty a lot of times and i think that support of monero on a philosophical level really requires sort of an inherent selflessness almost because you know if you're putting liberty first you're you can't also put your uh, yourself first, you know, it's like, it's, it's almost ironic in that regard. You know, if you think, if you, if you truly are putting liberty and privacy first and foremost, you are, um, you can't put your own self-interest ahead of it. It has to be behind it. Mm -hmm. And I think that most Bitcoin maximalists put their self-interest first. And I, so like I, like when El Salvador adopted it as legal tender, there was a massive support uh, level of support from a lot of maximalists in the space and people who I think should have known better, you know, and uh, bottom line is, you know, any law that requires people to do something, regardless of if they want to do it or not, it's enforced with violence from the government. If you don't follow that legal tender law, the government's going to come point a gun at you, throw you in a cage because you refuse to adopt Bitcoin as your legal tender. That's immoral. Like that's not okay. You know, so when you see stuff like that happening, you realize, I mean, even people like the guy from the Human Rights Foundation, I forgot his name, he was pushing for this. He said it was bad, you know, beneficial for the people. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I'm sure he's a great guy. But yeah. when I see the, the guy I, from the Human I, Rights I Foundation. I talk a, a long time ago before he became okay. an extreme Uber BTC maxi, but go ahead. It just doesn't mesh, mesh up for me, you know, where it's like you're supporting a, a politician imposing a viewpoint that you happen to agree with on a population of an entire country backed by guns and violence and jail time if you don't if you don't comply um that's not human rights like so monero bitcoin none of these these liberty loving or supporting currencies should require legal fiat you know because it is fiat that's what fiat means it's like a law that you cannot disagree with yeah, it's like, and uh, so I, I think that maximalists, for the most part, are in that camp. I think there's a very small minority that actually understand the true liberty aspects of Bitcoin and who would actually look at Monero and understand that it is important. It's critical uh, for the next level of what, what where we need to go. Now, they're also obviously working on privacy solutions for Bitcoin. But I think that Bitcoin is now so embraced by institutions and regulators that the people, I mean, there is centralized development communities, you know, that are really controlling a lot of what's happening with Bitcoin. And I just don't think that they're going to um, push features into Bitcoin that make it unregulatable or that scares off investors or institutional money. Um, I mean, it could end up being a hard fork situation where suddenly you have a private Bitcoin, but at that point, why, why bother when you already have Monero that's been working on perfecting its craft for years? You know, um, that's going to be the debate. I think the debate's going to happen at that point when they really want to push privacy features into Bitcoin that are going to make it unattractive to institutional investors, and then it's going to be why? Why should we bother? Right, we got Monero, and that's what you'll really start to see. The, the true cypherpunks that believe in the true ideals of what crypto is, those that, and those that really are just for the number go up, right? Which is oh, yeah. the oh, vast, yeah. vast majority of Bitcoiners, which 
is understandable. It's human nature. Uh, so a lot, a lot, most of this is driven by by greed, and it's it's a drug, man. When that number goes up, I don't th- I don't think people care what big. Bitcoin becomes at that point, as long as the number keeps going up. Yeah. Oh, that, I mean, yeah, again, it's, it's hard to separate out the, the value, the price side from the societal impact side, you know, and um, I think only the really truly enlightened people in the space are able to really do that. You know, I think that once you get to that level, you start to realize that it's not all created equally and that price is not a reflection of value to society. And I think that really more than any other case, use case in this world applies to Monero. I don't think the price of Monero today is anywhere close to a reflection of its importance in the world. And I think, uh, but that's not to say it's a buy and hold. It's to say, um, I mean, look, if you're buying and holding for 50 years, I would say, yeah. But I mean, if you're doing it for like most people, like five years or something like that, it's it's going to be a rocky road, you know. At that, that's my opinion on it. Yeah, yeah. I put just on a pure technological level. So, um, I know we're talking about its privacy elements, but just pure looking at it as a cryptocurrency, what crypto is supposed to be. And I'm not just just talking about privacy, but uh, de- decentralized and decentralized because you want it to be censorship resistant. You want it to be unconfiscatable. When you just look, stack coins next to each other, Bitcoin versus, you know, Ethereum versus Monero versus the other million coins that exist. Does Monero stand out for you for those reasons? And do you look at it that way? Or you're just looking at it as a privacy? Because I look at it as, you know, even just as, as, like I said, as digital, like if we're going to call Bitcoin digital gold, we have to just like, why? Why is it digital gold? What is it giving Mm -hmm. it those properties? Do you look at it that way as well? Do you make that assessment from a technological level? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I'm satisfied that Monero has reached a point where it's battle tested and that. Um, you know, most of the things that could go wrong with it have been discovered. And um, I mean, it's been years. Uh, obviously, it's never going to be completely done or completely foolproof. But from a technological point of view, I'm fully um, supportive of it. And, there, you know, obviously, there's even there's Monero forks that have come along after that have added features. Um, you know, there's there's more you can do with them in some in some regards, but they're less battle tested. They're more experimental. And so from that regard, I feel way more confident with Monero than with like a a Haven or something like that, you know? So, um, I I mean, Bitcoin itself, right? So like, look at, so privacy, privacy, right? Fungibility. I think, you know, Monero's got Bitcoin beat. And I personally think that's like an essential characteristic of digital cash of cryptocurrency. But then you have things just like decentralization, right? So the mining network, Bitcoin has large hash rate, but we saw, you know, China ban Bitcoin yet again, but we saw, we saw the hash rate plummet in Bitcoin, right? We saw a plummet Mm -hmm. Monero. You look at Monero's, it's just, you know, constant steady rise up mined by CPUs, uh, you know, so it's, it's maybe more decentralized in that respect. Do you, what do you think of, of those concepts? So in addition to the fungibility, um, it's decentralized nature versus bitcoins yeah in that regard i i agree i think i do think it's more decentralized in bitcoin from a mining perspective but also from a development perspective you know i think that bitcoin just because of the importance that it's gained and the amount of money at stake you know and you look at the amount of core developers that are being funded by corporations and um that are part of corporations there's clearly big players that are controlling a lot of decisions in Bitcoin. So from that point of view, yeah, I think um, I think that Monero has a lot more attractiveness as a people-powered uh, ecosystem. You know, the thing is though that Bitcoin's success and adoption by institutional investors is the main reason that it is at the price it's at now. And it's why it's at the market cap it's at. Without Bitcoin's success, Monero wouldn't have much of its success either. Well, first of all, obviously Monero was invented because Bitcoin was invented. But I mean, at this point, 
you know, if we were still dealing with a $2,500 Bitcoin, you know, and a, you know, $10 Monero, I mean, you wouldn't have the level of interest that we have in trying to develop Monero and trying to build a vibrant ecosystem. So it's weird how it all, it all has to work together in that regard. Um, but it's, I feel like it's, it's the only way that this can go is by continued institutional adoption by Bitcoin, Bitcoin becoming more and more acceptable to governments and to regulators, if only because they cannot control it. It's out of their control. So they have to be accepting of it. Um, kind of like gold, you know? And so, um, you know, Monero will grow as a like sort of hand in hand following along because the price of Monero is just naturally going to go up along with, every, you know, Bitcoin rises all waters with its price, you know? So I, I do think that, but I would, I would hope over time you do see Monero sort of rise up as, you know, in comparison to others um, simply because demand goes up. Yeah. And I think that that's how it has to happen, but yeah, I'm fully on board with you as far as the level of decentralization and, um, I think an argument can be made that Monero is the most decentralized cryptocurrency. Yeah, I, I think so too, obviously. But you know, I, I hold back, so it's it's nice to hear from others that are perhaps a little more open minded. Um, you know, and I, I think you're, you're doing that pretty well. Um, is there anything you want to bring up with regards to? I know we talked about Monero quite a bit uh, with regards to DeFi or anything, because I know that's kind of your area of expertise right now. Well, it's going to be interesting um, with DeFi, you know, as it's becoming regulated and accepted by institutions, there's still folks out there that are working on privacy solutions for DeFi, you know, and so we already have one called Tornado Cash, which is um, essentially a mixer on Ethereum. It's a mm -hmm. smart contract. Everybody deposits their ETH and it's, you know, mixes up, um, which is, is, useful for people that want privacy. There's other layer twos now that are um, developed, like there's one called Aztec that's that's gonna develop or is developing a privacy layer that could sit on top of Ethereum. Um, it's gonna be interesting to see how these are approached by regulators, because I, I do think that this is the kind of stuff that might, just because of its success and the amount of money flowing through them, they might be tackled even before Monero gets tackled by governments. You know, so uh, if we see sort of attacks on some of these tools that are being used with the billions and billions of dollars that are flowing through DeFi, it's going to be interesting. It'll be telling about what might be to come. Uh, I, I don't see, I don't see a way around this happening. I just don't. I, like I, I mean, I know for a fact that regulators are already looking, obviously at Monero, but also at these privacy tools. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a matter, and this I made the same argument just a year ago with DeFi. Like it's just, it's not if, but when they get to a level where they see an opportunity to pounce, you know. And with DeFi, it happened in the past few months, you know, where just spikes of volume and billions of dollars flowing through. Um, gave and, and plus violations of SEC, you know, of securities uh, regulations and stuff like that just gave them too many chances to just jump in, you know. And so once we start seeing um, breaches of whether it's KYC AML or um, the the new regulations, a six hundred dollar rule, you know, stuff like that. Once there's enough of these things piling up, then they're gonna tackle it. You know, it's it's a no brainer for them to tackle. And so it's going to be interesting to see how it goes with DeFi first, because I think there is, I think in a short amount of time, there's going to be a lot more value flowing through those privacy tools, um, potentially than what we see flowing through Monero uh, each day. You know, so it's, it's going to be only time is going to tell. Um, but uh, in the long run, I think again that those tools are going to be a lot easier to to tackle and shut down than Monero ever will be. So Monero isn't going away. They can only make it harder to use. They can keep you from buying it through legal means, but they can't kill it, right? They can't, they can never kill it. So, you know, even if when you need Monero, the day you need it, if its value is a dollar, 
you're still going to be happy it's there. <laughs> you know, still, you might even be happy it's a dollar because that's when you're getting in. But um, you know, it's it's. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to go to a dollar, but just saying like it, it, the price becomes irrelevant at that moment that you need it. Now you still got to hope that that by the time you don't need it anymore, that the price is still <laughs> where it is. I kind of wish Monero had a stable option like Haven, but uh, and I don't mean to name drop that one, but that's that's the one I know that's a fork. Um, Stable that is, is still uh yeah it's still a little too scary for me to use but and i'm not sure last time i looked they had quite a centralized mining uh situation but uh but anyway yeah so that's how i'm looking at it with ethereum um the other thing that i i don't know i wanted to ask you about um vulnerability wise because i do think that from from dealing in DeFi now for a while i've seen that nobody knows the vulnerabilities and the the weak points and the choke points in any code, even Bitcoin, nobody knows it better than the developers. And I'm a little spooked right now about the fluffy pony situation. Mm. And I don't know um, what the current, you know, what the current situation is, but I, I mean, I, I was just watching what was going on thinking, well, they've got this guy in a room, mm -hmm. get it, you know, looking for weaknesses in Monero. Like, I don't see anything else that, that could potentially be happening right now. <laughs> so I don't know what you think about it. Well, I mean, it's, you know, if, the, if that was a problem, then, you know, crypto doesn't work. You know, it's supposed to be, it's open source technology that that's reviewed as we go along by people that use it. So if uh, arresting Fluffy Pony and then putting pressure on him to do certain things, would essentially allow some kind of backdoor to be added to Monero or reveal that's already there, then it's it then it was always a problem. And it's good that it happened sooner than later is the way I would look at it. So mm. um, I don't think it's an issue. And like I said, if it is, then that means Monero was broken all along, you know? Um, but I don't see why that would be the case. I mean, we have so many people looking at the code. What, what influence can they possibly put on him that would allow him, you know, open up a vulnerability to Monero that they wouldn't already right. have access to, you know? Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I don't know how we could ever know, um, you know, if like, if that happened and I don't, the last thing I want to do is cast aspersions on him. Well, it'd be but... like, you know, uh, arresting, um, I don't know, Einstein and say, like, tell me more about this theory of relativity. Like, well, it's, it's all there. It's laid out. It's, it's, you could look, <laughs> if you could understand the math. You get it. If you don't, you don't. Uh, is there a vulnerability there? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. And to say that Fluffy Pony knows of some vulnerability that nobody else knows about wouldn't really make sense because he's not some super, you know, obviously extremely intelligent guy, but he's not some, uh, you know, some cryptographer genius. That, that makes sense. You know, people don't know, you know? Yeah. What we see in DeFi and Ethereum uh, with, with smart contracts is you can look at the code, you can read it 50 times. Um, but DeFi is so flexible in a way that only a developer sometimes can really know how the uh, the logic could be manipulated in a way where you could arbitrage in a really specific way or get a flash loan for 50 million and, and somehow fool the system into thinking something's happening when it's not. And so we've seen that happen. We've seen developers do that. They specifically write the code in a certain way where they know that you can't, at, gla at a first glance understand um we've talked about like do we need like economic audits like beyond just technical audits you need like economic audits to truly understand what you can do with this piece of code mm -hmm. um so but but that's a different use case like that's there's calculations happening and there's there's things happening that wouldn't be happening with a monero but it's just i always have this skeptical mind where uh what do the developers know you know that potentially keeps them up at night that we wouldn't know about. And that's the kind of stuff that I always get nervous when I hear there's meetings with the, the feds or they're arrested or you know, it's like stuff like that. I'm like, Oh man, I wish I knew what was keeping that developer up at night, but you're right that the community with Monero is so big now mm -hmm. and so many people are involved that there is a, you know, 
it's almost impossible, right, to have that sort of thing at this le level. Whereas with DeFi, you're talking about a team of five or 10 developers that yeah. might be working on code especially, with especially Monero. Monero yeah. too, because, you know, and Bitcoin, but Monero, because, you know, you steal it, it's a bearer asset, it, it's yours, right? So there's just so much to gain from being able to manipulate it, especially the fact that it's untraceable. So you're getting away scot-free. So uh, there's a lot, yeah. a lot of people that are trying to uh, take advantage of Monero in any way possible. You know, you could even say maybe even you would even have to uh, consider that Fluffy Pony is potentially one of those people, right? There's no, there's, you're not supposed to trust Fluffy Pony. You're supposed to assume that he is trying to manipulate the, you know, Monero himself and steal from it himself, right? If you're really going to look at this objectively, like if you don't have that mindset, then you're not looking at crypto the right way. So um, right. to say that, you know, he could be uh, apprehended by the state and then Monero, uh, can be taken advantage of. I, I, I don't know. I think that's, I, I think there's bigger, um, bigger potential issues than that. I just saw um, Snowden tweet something. Somebody asked him um, a question about OPSEC or something. And he just, he said, he, he said this before that he has to, the way he has to act is as, as if everything he uses and touches is, is compromised, you know, so his phone, his computer, you know, his internet, you know, everything. So to that extent, you know, if there was a way to surveil Monero, they wouldn't tell us, right? It's like they, they would just surveil it. So to that extent, you almost have to operate in a way that um, you have to assume that your transaction is still being seen. Mm -hmm. So OPSEC, and we all know this, if we are serious about this OPSEC, when you're purchasing it, you know, when you're, you're holding it, um, the way you're sending it, um, the moves you might make before you send it, you know, it's like you have to still operate in that way where you're protecting yourself if there is surveillance and you you really value your privacy. Mm -hmm. And this isn't just for doing bad things. This isn't just for doing illegal things. This is for anybody who wants to have privacy, who doesn't want the government watching every single thing they do because government is, uh, as uh, Jefferson said, I think, government at its best is, a necessary evil and at its worst an intolerable evil mm -hmm. like there's no good government and so uh if you truly value your privacy you're going to take all those steps and you're going to assume it's already compromised you're going to assume that it's available by the cia or somebody like that uh god forbid you know um uh, worst governments out there you know if you're living in a dictatorship somewhere you know you got to assume you're in north korea they're probably looking at it you know, as they're tr trying to find ways. So but I also wouldn't doubt that governments are using Monero already, you know, to do private transactions. You know, they're, they talk out of both side of, sides of their mouth on every issue. So I wouldn't doubt that, that governments are using Monero to send money back and forth. Yeah. The, uh, you know, if they eliminate the suitcase of cash. They're going to need a way to, to send cash to people. Right. I mean, go governments do things like that as well. They, they use cash as well. And they're they're going to need digital cash. So, Oh yeah. There's, mm -hmm. there's reasons why they may want Monero to exist. Uh, yeah. just to, just to perhaps close it out. So like, uh, like you did, you did mention that, you know, you, you have these marketing skills and I think you've, you've demonstrated that in, in the way you've run your, your YouTube show and, uh, the platform you've grown. Any advice to the Monero community on perhaps what they can be doing to better market Monero or help grow Monero? Because I think I think you said you even worked in those industries, right? The, this idea of um, you know br growing products. So any any advice that you could think of to the gen for the general Monero community on what can be done to help grow Monero? Like I said before, I think to me, Monero equals privacy and privacy equals Monero. And the price of Monero is the price of privacy. And that's how people value privacy, I think, on that level. So I think that um, I would love to see less price talk, less moon talk, you know, and more, um, you know, almost like, like tour level marketing, you know, or... Um, you know, other other projects that really focus on privacy as a first principle, and obviously Monero does, but too many people look at it as, should I invest in Monero or not? They look at, that's how they look at it. They don't look at it as, uh, should I invest in privacy or not? 
You know, and I think that um, marketing Monero should really be focused around, continue to be, and a lot of people already do this, but even more so focused on the value principle, the importance of, of, of privacy rather, um, and a vision for the future, which I haven't seen a lot of with Monero. I know it's out there, people have talked about, but why this is going to be so important in five years and 10 years. I think that where I get concerned is the uh, sustainability of the ecosystem, you know, and if there was an attack on Monero um, by government, if it becomes illegal to develop on Monero, if it becomes illegal to hold Monero, what's going to happen to the development? You know, so I would love to see proactive work of some sort being done to plan for that. You know, I think that, um, and obviously there's a lot of anonymity already um, in the space, but I just, that's, that's my main point of concern. If Monero gets attacked, if the price drops to 25 bucks because all of a sudden it's illegal, everybody dumps, it's like, you know, where from there, you know, it's like, we need to, some sort of a, of a, a vibrant, eco. I would be donating to Monero. And is there, is there a way to uh, donate to Monero development? Yeah. I don't even know. Okay. So I should be doing more of that because I donate to Tor and to Tails and to all these different projects. Yeah, that, there's the general, general fund. I just did a, you know, the CCS community no. uh, funding system that Monero uses. Okay. Um, I just did one actually. So I'm, I got funded by the Monero community to work on Monero related projects for six months. So Monero talk. So I'm using that money to help bootstrap the grow, you know, trying to grow this channel. And then I started another company called gratuitous. I don't know if you saw that, but we, we basically, we yeah. sell coffee and then we allow you to send tips in Monero that go directly to the workers on the Guatemalan farm where we get the coffee from. Cool. And then we're trying to That's add great. products and showcasing, you know, a positive use case for Monero, something that you couldn't do without crypto. Right. Um, right. Long story short though, I got, I got funding from the Monero community through the CCS uh, and there's new ones that always pop up there. Uh, it could be, you know, some developer that wants to contribute in some way that wants to work on some aspect of Monero. And then there's also just a general fund that you can contribute to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's excellent. Yeah. So, but to sum it up, I, I think, um, when I think of Monero, I don't think of today. Mm -hmm. I think of the future. I really do. I really see it as something we're going to need, uh, as, western sort of american you know europeans um uh so i would like to see more of that kind of storytelling because i think that's what really hits home with a lot of people and it could be what garners more support you know as opposed to saying you should be using monero today i just don't think people are going to buy into that the same way they're not buying into anything else that's good for them from a liberty point of view <laughs> we just have to be realistic you know it's uh we're the, the people working on Monero are are selfless people that are really that are building a tool that is going to be critical for financial freedom, you know. And I I want to find more ways to support that myself. And I think that we should try to be pushing that message out there to the world, you know, because the world is not going to turn around tomorrow and say we support breaking the law in order to keep our privacy. <laughs> it's just you know it's, it's just not. Um, so that's going to be the challenge. Yeah. Awesome, Matt. No, all good points. Thank you so much. Thanks for doing the Monero talk. Greatly. Yeah, man. My pleasure. I love talking privacy. Where can people learn more about what you're working on and follow you? I guess, obviously, on Twitter, right? Anything else you want to Yeah. Places? At Chris Black. Um, I have a podcast for DeFi fans uh, called Proof of Decentralization. So um, you can find that. I, I tweet new episodes as well. And uh, what I do there is I bring on DeFi developers who are willing to actually defend the decentralization of their of their projects, which there's I'm having a hard time finding guests, but <laughs> because a lot of them don't want to talk about that. Um, but the ones that do come on at usually are pretty open and, and you learn a lot about the vulnerabilities and the, the problems in DeFi. Uh, I'm all about transparency. I just want people to be honest, you know. So if you're building something, just tell people what could go wrong. Tell people what kind of control you keep, and we're cool, you know. If you do it in plain English on the front page, you know. If you bury it deep, if you do it in some jargon, nobody's going to understand. If you make it hard for people to comprehend, especially in cases where I mean, there's layer twos with Ethereum where there's 
three, four, five billion dollars on the layer two. And there's um, one is specifically is, is called Arbitrum. It's a layer two. It's a company in New York City that holds a private key uh, to this entire blockchain. And if that private key got compromised, all of the funds could be drained. So if they got a, a subpoena, a warrant, a regulator comes in, whatever, FBI comes in and says, use that private key to drain the money, to freeze the chain, to do whatever, it could happen. There's no mention of it on their, on their front page, on their, you know, it's, it's, they, their response is, oh, we've mentioned it in blogs here and there, you know, but nobody know when I tweeted it, everybody's like, what? I just deposited $50,000 there. You're telling me three guys in New York have the key? New York, the most regulated city in America. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's what I've been working on with DeFi, but that's the podcast. And But I tweet about a lot of different issues with Liberty, and uh, it, it frustrates a lot of Ethereum folks because they tend to be on the other side of the debates with vaccines and things like that. But uh, um, so, yeah, it's usually a fun time on my Twitter feed. Well, it's nice to meet another Liberty guy. Che cheers to you, man. Thanks for the work. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Appreciate it. I'll uh, I'll send you a coffee too, man. I'll send you a bag of coffee and uh, maybe oh sweet, I love coffee. If you like it, you could send a tip to the farmers there. All thanks, right, right on. Thanks again. Uh, thanks, Douglas. If you're ever in New York, I don't know, hit me up. Maybe we could actually grab a cup of coffee or something. Oh, cool. I will be. All right, All right man. Have a good day. You too. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.